Please welcome the director of the Institute of Latin American Studies, Victoria Morillo, and the constitutional president of the plurinational state of Bolivia, His Excellency Luis Arce Catacora. Welcome everyone to this new meeting of the World Leaders Forum. I am Vicky Murillo, I'm the director of the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University, and I'm really thrilled to be introducing this event co-sponsored by the World Leaders Forum, the Columbia Global Center, and the Institute of Latin American Studies. Today, we have the pleasure of having the visit of His Excellency, President Luis Alberto Arce Catacora, who would be in conversation with University Professor Joseph Stiglitz. President Luis Arce is a Bolivian politician and economist. He has been a Minister of Economic Affairs and Public Finance of the Plurinational State of Bolivia and has served as the President of the Plurinational State of Bolivia since 2020. After recovering democracy from a de facto government, winning a very impressive election with more than 50% of the vote, he has been able to make uh, his economy grow again, going from a negative 11% to a positive 4.4% according to data from the World Bank. Uh, and the project and, and all of the data projects Bolivia to continue growing in 2021. President Luis Alberto Arce also has a master's degree in economics from the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom and a bachelor's degree in economics from the Universidad Mayor de San Andres in Bolivia. He was awarded the Palmas Académicas Universidad Obrera Distinction in the Gold Category by the Universidad Nacional del Siglo XX in Potosí and honored as an outstanding teacher by the Universidad Mayor de San Andres. He has honorary doctorates from Los Andes University and the Frank Tamayo University. He's the author of many books and articles, most recently, El Modelo Económico Social Comunitario Productivo Boliviano, and he has a vast experience teaching undergraduates and graduate students at public and private universities in the plurinational state of Bolivia. He has also lectured at numerous universities abroad, including Georgetown, American, Pittsburgh, Harvard, University of Chicago, and the University of Buenos Aires. I'm very glad about that. Today we have the honor, and that was my alma mater, today we have the honor of having him visiting us at Columbia University. Uh, welcome to Columbia, His Excellency. We're very, very happy to have you with us. We also have him in conversation with University Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who's an American economist, and, uh, and he's also the co-chair of the high-level expert group on the measurement of economic performance and social progress at the OECD, and the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute. Prof. Stiglitz is a recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 2001 and the John Bates Clark Medal in 1979. He's a former senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank and a former member and chairman of the U.S. President Council of Economic Advisors. In 2000, Prof. In 2000, Professor Stiglitz founded the Initiative for Policy Dialogue, a think tank on international development based at Columbia University, and he has been a member of the Columbia faculty since 2001 and received the university's highest academic rank, university professor, in 2003. Known for his pioneering work on asymmetric information, Stiglitz's work focusing on income distribution, risk, corporate governance, public policy, macroeconomic, and globalization. In 2001, he was named by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. This is an extraordinary opportunity for our community at Columbia University to have a conversation with, of this caliber with two extraordinary speakers who I'm sure will teach us a lot and will give our students a fresh look on economic policy making amidst a pandemic, among other topics. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency President Arce and Professor Stiglitz. Let me first be, uh, add my word uh, of welcome uh, to you. Uh, and this is a, a special event because this is actually the, 
the first big public event oh, right. after COVID-19. So it's, it's nice <laughs> to be able to welcome you. Um, also, uh, I always, I, I know I'm prejudiced about this, uh, but I always feel good having an economist as a president. I, I think the, uh, that, that makes the prospects. But I thought maybe we would begin by you giving a, a, a little statement about why you've been so successful in restoring growth in Bolivia, some of the broad challenges, just a few minutes before we get into a question and answer. Well, thank you very much, Professor Stiglitz and all of you here in, in Columbia University. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, well, first of all, as many of you may know, uh, Bolivia in, 2000, in 2019, uh, we had a uh, coup d'etat where they become a new government, where they changed our model. We were in a model which we call the communitarian productive social uh, economic model, uh, which was made in, for us, I mean, for uh, people in the university in, in Bolivia, made by Bolivian professionals for the Bolivian economy. It was the, the first idea we had in mind at the time. And we put in place in 2006, and it, it was successful. But then, after the coup d'etat, they returned to the neoliberalist model. The neoliberalism model showed the bad re economic and social results in October, November, uh, sorry, November, December, January, February, and March, because we, we, the pandemia in Bolivia appears, appeared in March uh, last year. So five months, uh, more or less, the neoliberalism model was there, and uh, we went back in economic and social indicators, and then, of course, the pandemic came and affected completely the economy. The economy. Um, we had last year nine percent of recession. Uh, the, uh, the the fiscal budget uh, or the fiscal deficit increased up to more than eleven percent of the GDP. We reduced. We, well, so. We, go, we went back in the uh, Gini coefficient, for example. Also, the unemployment went up to 11% from 4%. Uh, also, uh, we have the poverty increased again. And when we became uh, government in October last year, uh, and also I, I remember our discussions, uh, Professor Stiglitz there, in November, we took some uh, measures, political measures, in order to uh, make the economy uh, react. And what we did? All the pandemia has two effects, on the demand side and on the supply side. We started to increase, to enhance the internal demand. The internal demand we increased by two ways. The first one is to increase the demand uh, for uh, of the people, you know, uh, giving them a technique, a, a um, transfer, a, a conditional transfer, you know, uh, what we call the bono contra lambre, to everybody who didn't have at the time a, a job, because in my country, more or less 30 percent, 35 percent of the population, they are they have a job, you know, they 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 have wages, salaries. But the rest of the people, they work by themselves, and they earn each, each day, you know, what they did, what they do every day. And in the pandemic, the, the, the facto government, they did just go, go home and remain there, and people need to eat, need, need many things that they didn't have the opportunity to work. So, at that time, the, uh, the internal demand was completely destroyed. So that's why we started to improve the internal demand with these conditional transfers that we call bono contra lambre. And I started to give them back the BAT for people who have uh, uh, low wages. Uh, also, we increase the, well, actually, we react our, our public investment, which for our model is very important 
because internal demand is not only consumption but also investment, public investment, especially public investment. In our model, the state has an uh, in, important role in the, in the economy. So if the state is not uh, pushing the internal demand, the investment uh, in, the, in our model doesn't work. I mean, I think in the neoliberalist model, the private sector should be investing, mm -hmm. right? But in our case, is the public sector because of many things that maybe later on we can discuss if there's some question about our model. But what we did is only to push the internal demand and also public investment, which was completely uh, destroyed, you know, when we came to the government. And that's one of the things. The other, the other uh, the, um, thing we do, we did uh, in the past, uh, in, in last year was also to enhance the productive sector. Um, the, gov the, the de facto government uh, cancel a huge policy that we had with the uh, financial sector, the banking sector. What it was that? We set a 60% of the total loans of the banks should be for loans to the productive or uh, housing sectors. When they were in the government, just, you know, they kill uh, this policy. But now, again, when we reest reestablished this uh, measure for for our government and for the people, and that thing, I, it's one of the things. Secondly, what we did is we put in place a trust fund in order to make loans for a industrialization process and a, um, import substitutions in my country with 0.5% annually of interest rate. Uh, then also we free from tax investments and Im good imports, capital good imports, and so on, in order to improve all the, uh, the, the machinery that we need in order to get the industrialization process with import substitution. And we succeed, we succeed. Also, we are uh, backing all the improvement in the agriculture sector. Bolivia is a country where, you know, uh, has the, the, the smallest, uh, smallest uh, productivity in land, in, in agriculture. So we are improving them in order to make all the sustainable f uh, 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 produ uh, agriculture production. All these things are set in place and uh, they are giving us uh, the, uh, the economic growth now we have. Um, last year, I, as I said, we had 9% of recession. Now we are looking in August to more than 8% of the growth uh, uh, rate. And we are looking to finish this, uh, this year at least 6% of GDP growth rate, which is very important for us, but more important. We have reduced the unemployment rate from 11 to 6. Still higher than the, that the, from the 4% we had in, in, in 2018-19, but uh, from 11 I think it's a good uh, figure. And uh, we also introduced some redistribution uh, policies. Uh, uh, for example, we introduced a tax, a uh, high, high income tax, you know, for rich people, we introduce it, and we have a important uh, tax, you know, tax uh, revenue for uh, this uh, new tax. And of course, it means that we are recovering our redistribution, uh, redistribute model that we built up since 2006. So just in order to resume one thing, we have a internal demand, uh, enhance the, product, the production and productivity and uh, redistribution, income redistribution. Those are the key, the key questions that uh, are giving us this recovery, this economic recovery that now all in my country are, you know, uh, facing and then 
they are feeling in the pockets as well. Well, thank you. That was really very interesting. Maybe just a couple questions about the, the Bolivian model, both now and, and, and where. We've gotten a, a large list of questions uh, before we started. I'm going to weave some of them into to my uh, conversation. Um, wh one question um, is, one of the things that was very uh, striking about Bolivia is how much you reduced inequality mm -hmm. since uh, President Morales uh, became mm -hmm. the president. Do you want to say a word about how you did that? Sure. That was the same, the same recipe, you know, uh, income redistribution through our bonds, our, our transfer, you know, conditional transfers. We had uh, five uh, conditional transfers. Also, we have some subsidies, for example, electricity. In the cities, we, boy, we pay more uh, for the electricity than the, in the rural area. And it's a, a kind of, you know, cross, uh, uh, cross uh, subsidy. subsidy. Uh, and things like that. And also, we increase the salaries. We increase the income of the families with many other uh, uh, policies. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we didn't make poorer to the rich people, we did, we did, you know, much, much richer, the poor people. Yeah. So that's why, you know, uh, we have a Gini coefficient coming down from more or less 0.46, you know, to 0 0.37, 36 in the Gini coefficient. Uh, we, as uh, together with Brazil, Bolivia was one of the uh, more income concentrate on a country in the in South America but now at that time uh, now I can't say you anything but at that time uh, from the that place we were the fifth better income distribution country in the region so we did that redistribution income uh, with policies that the state you know taking in, 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 in charge so you, you mentioned import substitution policies in the uh, 1980s, uh, import substitution policies got a very bad name in, in Latin America. Uh, do you want to comment on that and some of the ways in which your import substitution policies are different from those like in Brazil that were fa that failed? Or sure, sir. you know, the pandemic just showed us that in South America, even in Latin America, I would say many countries are now import dependent in uh, you know all the drugs and and vaccines and everything that we need in order to uh, face the pandemic and all the health problems that we have uh, in our country we are importing and that's not good and more more than that why income why import substitution because if you look at what the indigenous peoples have done against the pandemic. They used the traditional medicine, you know, the, the medicine that they learned from the fathers and, and, and so on, you know. And that kind of medicine was that they used in order to face COVID-19, right? And they succeed. So we in, in South America and in many countries, we can use the, tra the traditional medicine in order to fight it. And that's it. That, that is industrialization and sub import substitution, for example. And we have a lot of uh, another examples that Bolivia has. You know, the neoliberalists, what they didn't do any time was to industrialize the country. What the neoliberalists da have done in, in Bolivia particularly is that uh, they came for our national resources, they explode them, and they, they don't leave anything, even industry. So that's why we have to make the process of industrialization and industrialization with import substitution because at that time, especially in the current international world, where everybody is coming back to, be, to become from the free trade or the globalization to a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to defend itself, the country. And it's not now looking for a globalization process. Right? Everybody is protecting 
the economies. So in, a, in America Latina and in Bolivia, we have to understand what's going on and prepare for, in any case, uh, something can occur okay. over afterwards. So one of the things happening, one of the, your, your sources of strength have, in the past has been natural gas, and that revenue has been going down. Mm -hmm. And some people are very optimistic about your lithium deposits, sure. which I think are the largest, or among the yes. largest in the world. Um, do you want to say a word about how you're thinking about developing that and um, the... Uh, there are many worries that when people talk about developing lithium, about the environment, about uh, bringing in foreign investors, including Chinese investors. Mm -hmm. do, uh, do you want to say uh, any? Sure. Well, actually, our model is based on the national resources, but industrializing our national resources, not only exploding like a gas, like a lithium, we have iron as well. We can export also electricity and many other things, uh, even food, when we improve the, the productivity in the, in the agriculture sector, we can export. So the, the key issue for us is that we have the national resource, but we need to industrialize them because otherwise we will repeat the, 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 the past history and we are not going in that way. So we need technology, we need to have agreements with uh, uh, special partners, let's say, in order to industrialize, but the industrialization has to be in my country. That's the only condition that we put to the international investors, you know. The foreign direct investment can come to Bolivia. If we are talking about the national resources, according to the constitution, the current constitution, we need to have as a country 51, at least 51% of the business. Okay, if they agree, they can come, make the business with us, and uh, go together. Actually, before the coup d'etat in 2019, we were just arriving in an agreement with a Germany company in order to explode and industrialize the lithium in Bolivia. And then, you know, yeah, whatever you know, the, what, came the coup d'etat and so on. But we are, again, restarting all this process, inviting all the companies. There are a couple of United States companies, uh, you know, trying to get in the Bolivian lithium, also Russia, also China, or European countries. Everybody is there, you know, because we are doing a, a kind of competition which is going to give you, give us a better technology with direct extraction of lithium, you know, and uh, the timing, the quality of the lithium they can extract with their technology, uh, and the timing for industrializing uh, our lithium. Uh, the best of the proposals, we will sign an agreement with them in order to industrialize the lithium, but in Bolivia. And they also, the companies, the, the, the private international companies, they have to assure us markets for our batteries, for our whatever they wanted to, to produce, no problem at all. Even we have in mind to produce uh, uh, vehicles. Why, why is that? Because we also have a huge mine in iron of, in my country. So we have all the national resources in order to become, you know, an industrialized country. We have the national resources. We don't need to sell any more the raw material. We, we have the raw material, the natural resources, but also we are trying to, to this, uh, this kind of business in order to attract all the FDIs. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, your constitution um, and the, in your neighbor, uh, Chile, there's a constitutional convention going on. Do you want to say something about what you thought were the big advances in your constitution and what Chile might learn from Bolivia? Oh, well, I think every country is different one to another. But uh, I think uh, they can take some of our experiences. In fact, I know that there are some indigenous leaders in, in Chile that are getting in touch with some of our leaders in, in Bolivia in order to get, uh, get some experience of what was the constituency assembly. 
and I think they are going uh, very well, the relationship, in order to avoid all the mistakes we did in the past, <laughs> but also learn, learn on our mistakes. So one of the questions I, 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 that came in from uh, uh, one of the students was, uh, in what way do you think is your government going to be different from Morales' government uh, before? And, you know, both in economic policy, but I've talked too much about economics because uh, that's my passion, <laughs> but in other dimensions as well. Well, uh, everybody, uh, every people is different from other people, uh, but uh, we have only one process of change in my country. We, we call the change processing, uh, that is only one, that uh, it started in 2006. We are going to follow all because I was there, you know, it's not a strange thing for me, I was there, building up our process and democratic, economic and social measure policies, I was there. So we're going to change, we're not going to change what we don't think that uh, it was not working, let's say. No? But um, what we are now uh, trying to get more emphasis is, you know, the industrialization process, increasing the productive agriculture and other sectors, and so on. So, uh, in order, of course, the healthy problem is, all, is also another issue for us, uh, because all over the world is changing their minds uh, in order to face what uh, all the problems in the, the world is facing. So, um, I don't think we'll be uh, huge change in the policies because, as I said, I was there yeah, yeah, doing the policies as well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so w another question that came in uh, has to do with the, the pandemic and uh, in what ways was, uh, was Bolivia's strategy different and similar from the other countries in your neighborhood and oh. elsewhere? And how did you see the trade-off that some people made a big deal uh, between health and economics. Mm -hmm. Okay, good questions, Professor. First, the, the main difference we have is the, that the national resources in our model, from our point of view, have to be under the state property. So we have to nationalize all of them, you know? You know, to have all the natural resources. Because if you do not control the natural resource, you are not in charge of the natural resource, you cannot apply what we have done in our model. That's the, the big difference with other countries that can, you know, try to do the same. But if they don't control the, the natural resource by the state, it will be very difficult to, to do similar things that we have done. In the second part of your question, um, you have to combine the economic with the health because in, in the Bolivian experience, the, the past government, the de facto government, they what they have done is only, uh, supposedly, uh, only care about health and forget economy. And then in an economy where the characteristics I have just told you, that we have 35% you know, working for the wages, and more than 60% just working by themselves, you know, that's the wrong way to approach the problem of the economy and the health. What we are doing in my country is a combination of both. The re common, e economy recovery is very important, but of course you cannot, uh, you know, avoid to uh, face also the health problem. Uh, and we are doing both things. I think the correct way to face this kind of thing is to, do, to balance, you know, economic and health. Because if it's then there is no economy, uh, you can, <laughs> you don't have anything. But of course, on the other side, if only you look at the health problem, you you are not you are going to have a huge problem. That that's the way we are facing. That's that's the problem we are facing in uh, last year in our government. Yeah. So uh, there are a, a number of questions about politics. Uh, which I uh, hesitate to, to uh, tread on, but I'll read them anyway. One of them is, can you possibly tell us about the difference between those Bolivians who supported uh, Mas, your, your party, and uh, those who supported the attempted coup? 
Well, it's uh, actually, the results of the elections were very clear. The most important opponent we have in the past elections, they, they get no more than 30% of the votes. We got 55%, and I think that's clear. Yeah. Uh, is there any difference in, in the socioeconomic background of the groups is, is there, uh, that supported you versus supported my, oh. but versus For the, us, it's very clear. We have low-income people, uh, you know, uh, uh, voting for us, or the poor people, the indigenous people, people who work in the rural area is, of course, voting for us. But also in the cities, we have, a, a, you know, important part of media, uh, media class as well, which is very important uh, for us. Uh, why? Because everybody is worried about the economy, and they know that mass have a good performance managing the economy. And when the right parties become the government, there is corruption, there is no money, there is no investment, there is no result for people. So that's why I think people vote for us, and we are working for those people who vote for us. So, uh, you know, I, uh, we live in a very polarized country, uh, United States, and uh, we're feeling very frustrated about being able to bring people together. Do you have any sense about, you know, and Bolivia has been very divided. Is there any strategy you have of trying to bring people on the other side to uh, support you more besides the model of good government and, and good economy? Um, is there anything you can say to persuade the, the, the right that uh, you're doing the right thing? Actually, you have one-third of the population in the right-hand side, you know, and one-third in the left-hand side. So you have one-third, which is the middle class mostly, that they decide. Sometimes they can, you know, realize that it's better going to the right-hand side or to the left-hand side. Uh, but in our case, it was very clear what is the most important worries of people? Economy. Why we get more votes than the right hand side? Because we did a better job managing the economy than the right parties. And I think uh, and understand that that's, that's why they, they were giving us another opportunity to manage the country. And as we were talking at the beginning, we are succeeding because we are demonstrating that the mass has a project, has a program, has a model that is giving good results for people. So uh, some people see the success of the left in Bolivia as part of a broader uh, movement in Latin America and else elsewhere. Do you, do you have any view of, of, one of the students talked about a pink tide. Uh, what is your dream, short or long term, for United Latin American left? Oh, well, actually, you know, it's much easier to talk to all the other presidents that have the same idea in mind. Of course, it's much easier to do it. And, uh, of course, we would like to have, you know, many other presidents that, that you know, you can talk to. But, uh, in any case, if there's no that kind of president, we, we still we have to talk to them. We have to make business for people. We have to do, you know, whatever is needed in order to get better results for our, our countries. And uh, that's it. I mean, uh, one has to be very objective looking at what you have in front of you. If it's better, of course, for us, it's much better to talk to a uh, left-hand man or president, of course, of course. You can understand they have the, the same needs, the same ideas. You can propose, you know, 
uh, projects that everybody will will be happy with but uh, you have to do it whatever is needed in order to uh, get better days for people good so we're supposed to begin a question and answer with our um, zoom all right so um, I guess I don't know how this works uh, somebody is going to call on oh there it is okay ah, hello can, I, can everyone hear me Yes. All right, starts perfect. Wonderful. Okay, here. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, hey um, I'm Blair. I'm an uh, MA student uh, here at the European Institute at Columbia. And I was just curious about um, where you see the economies of Latin America in, in general and Bolivia in the next five to ten years. That was the question. Okay. There are many countries that, ha that are in a huge problem that if they don't resolve now, um, and most of them, are related to how they manage their national resources. If they are still the natural resources in private hands, it is much, much likely that they don't do, cannot do anything and uh, they will have facing huge economic problems later on. Uh, also, some countries in, in Latin America are facing you know, high le uh, debt levels. And, and that's another worry of many countries that uh, that's why we were asking in United Nations and World Bank and others that it's important to talk about the debt, to relieve the debt of these countries, otherwise uh, these countries will be in problem. It's not our case, fortunately, but uh, we are uh, talking about for many countries that are facing that. Good. Next question. Uh, hi, my, my name is Juan Pablo. I am a civil engineer uh, from the Universidad Mayor de San Andres, and I'm doing my master's degree here at Colombia. My question is, what politics, uh, economic politics, have been doing in the construction and infrastructure sector of Bolivia, which is one of the most affected by the pandemics, be being construction one of the important pillars of Bolivian economy? Thank you, President. Well, it's a good question because when we came, uh, became government, there, is, there was no private, uh, public investment at all. So all, all the infrastructure, buildings and so on, what we were building up, they were or stopped or completely destroyed. So what we are doing, and construction is increasing 30% in the GDP. So it's a very important sector that is uh, reacting. Uh, and what we have done, of course, is to uh, reestablish the public investment. The state is uh, renewing all the contracts we have for roads and all, and all kind of buildings that we were doing. Uh, so that has an, a, a huge impact in the construction sector. As I told you, 30% is the growth rate of construction in these eight months. Impressive. Next question. Hello, my name is Olivia Steeler and I'm a student at Columbia College. And I was wondering how COVID-19 has shaped the priorities and your economic policy goals and the means that you're taking to reach these goals. Oh, we are going to do the same. Uh, it means uh, increase the production, uh, uh, import substitution in, with industrialization process and more important thing, ready income redistribution, which is the key question in order to have a more equal country. We, we start from, from a very uh, simple point of view. If a country is more equal, the growth rate go faster. So one of the things that's happened uh, in the United States is that the uh, pandemic has actually increased inequalities course, and exposed them. Course. Is that also? Yes, it happened in my country as well. Yeah. But one of the really interesting things in the United States was that the mass of government spending, which was about 25% of GDP, mm. prevented an increase in poverty. So we actually managed, in spite of the fact that the disease was affecting the poor and they were losing their jobs. We offset that effect by, uh, with, with uh, President Biden and the other 
uh, measures to, to stop pover uh, poverty from increasing. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I, that's the way you have to manage the problem. Next question. Good evening, President Parasek uh, Atacora. My name is Kevin Colarubias, and I am a master's student in the political science program. My question for you is, how do you think Bolivia's and other Latin American countries' cooperation with China's Belt and Road Initiative will benefit your efforts to create an economy of Mother Earth, as you put it, and find alternative methods of combating climate change? Thank you. Uh, well, it's a, 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 a key question for us because we we work in order to meet with Mother Earth. And development, you know, uh, implies uh, that we have to invest more money in order to be uh, according to the Mother Earth uh, life. Uh, what I mean, for poor countries to reach the development, it's most costly now that because we have to introduce in the costs, obviously, a new technology, whatever, which is, you know, friendly with the Mother Earth. And of course, for us, it's much more uh, difficult to get this kind of development, but we have to do it. And that's why, of course, you know, we, we are asking always in the international forums that we need technology transfer from the rich countries. And why is that? Because if we don't have that technology, yeah, we need to develop as well as they did in the past. And in the past, the rich countries, they didn't take into account Mother Earth on all the uh, the problems that they are face, that we are facing now, and that's why we ask to the rich peoples to become, you know, more uh, equitative with the technology, and they they should transfer all the technology to our countries that we need to develop because we have people as well. They live, they they want to live, they want to eat, they want to dress, whatever, and uh, we need to uh, to develop, and that's that's why we need the technology. So that's the main issue for them. And when you talk to all the South American countries, everybody, you know, even the right parties in the power now, they agree that that's the, the, the main problem for us, the transfer technology. And that's why when you see all the statements in the international forums, all the presidents become, you know, asking for the technology or whatever uh, ways in order to reduce the cost for developing in our countries. Next question. Uh, bienvenido, estimado señor presidente. Welcome, dear president, to Columbia University. Faculty member at the business school. I teach the Impact Venture Incubator course focused on startups addressing problems affecting people on the planet. Uh, my question for you, sir, is this. How do you view entrepreneurship as a positive agent of change for the Bolivian people? In the second part of the question, if I may, uh, what national policies are you considering to bolster tech-based innovation through entrepreneurship in Bolivia? Gracias. Well, we are open to all te technologies that can come to Bolivia to help us to develop. Uh, and uh, we understand that there the most uh, need, uh, the, the need, the, the, the huge need we we have, is in the small producers, rather than the, in the in the big enterprises. You know, and they can buy the technology, they can solve the problems by themselves. But we need to help the small and uh, micro enterprises where we are uh, focusing in our policy, and that's why we have you know reduced the VAT and all the taxes for uh, capital goods imports. So we are focusing on this sector, but of course everybody is benefiting from our policy, but uh, we understand that uh, we have to do some, something more for this kind of sectors, which is our, our worry. It means 
the micro and the small enterprises. And what about finance for those small enterprises? Oh, we have a good school of uh, uh, micro funding, you know. Bolivia and Peru, I think, in, the, in South America, should be the countries that have more experience and more uh, experience to transfer in the micro financing. Uh, and, you know, it's very important for us. And also, uh, they have special uh, financial rules uh, in, in Bolivia for small bankings that helps to small producers. You know, we have a special, a special policies for them. And do you encourage or force banks to uh, allocate a certain fraction of their portfolio to small businesses? <laughs> well, the 60% that was I was talking at the beginning is for all. I mean, uh, big enterprises and small enterprises. You can have, the, 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 the thing is that the banks have to have 60% of the loans in productive. It doesn't matter the, uh, the, the, the size of the enterprise uh, uh, in the productive sector or uh, housing. So that's uh, the last, uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday uh, yeah, the day after, the, uh, before yesterday, I have a thesis uh, of uh, my, one of the, my students in the university, and they demonstrate that this law, I mean, the law that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, that the banks should uh, loan 60% uh, uh, of the loans in, into the productive and housing was the main issue that, that explains the economic growth. So uh, we are starting and uh, based on that thesis, we are thinking maybe we can increase 60% to 70% if it's needed, because uh, we need in, at, that, at this time, you know, an enhance in the productive sector, and that could be a, a good idea. We are exploring, we are not saying that, but it could be a good idea. So one part of the, America's banking system is called CRA, Community Reinvestment Act, mm -hmm. and it requires 10% of banks' portfolio to go to underserved parts of our society. Okay. And it's been very effective. You know, the banks figure out how to make good loans to people who otherwise would not have been served. Mm -hmm. Something to think about. Yes. Next question. Greetings from the other side of the country, from Oakland, California. I am Claudia Gonzalez from the Institute from the Study of Human Rights 2021-2022 Alliance for Historical Dialogue and Accountability Fellowship Program at Columbia University. And my question is as following. Given the extraordinary outcome of the past 14 years of Bolivian socioeconomic growth, how do you think, Mr. President, that the Bolivian experience and lessons can be shared regionally and globally? Thank you. It's a good question, thank you. <laughs> um, whenever I was uh, trying to explain our economic model, uh, this question arise. And we said, the model, our model is very simple. We take advantage of the national resources and make the redistribution process, not only in, in people, but also in sectors, because from the uh, you know, national resource primary sector, we are trying to get to industrialization and to increase the, in, the industrial sector and other, and other sectors based on the extractive sector. When you find a country who has you know, uh, national resources, and the national resources are under state control, you can apply our model easily because we, are, we, we have succeeded on our model. But if you don't have national resources or having national resources are not under the state control, uh, probably the, the model uh, cannot work. It's probably. I mean, it depends, I think, in every country. Next question. 
Hello, Your Excellency. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Keith Chabla, and I'm a graduate student at the School of International Public Affairs at Columbia University. My question for you is, women and girls in Bolivia remain at a high risk of gender-based violence despite legal protection in Bolivia. Gender-based violence has the characteristic of not knowing any economic and social boundaries. How do you think this impacts Bolivia's economy? Okay, could you, could you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Women and girls in Bolivia remain at a high risk of gender-based violence despite legal protection. Gender-based violence has the characteristic of not knowing any economic or social boundaries. How would it impact Bolivia's economy, in your opinion? Well, one of the gender, gender problems we have is because women don't have a, a economic independence. Um, so we are working on improve the economy for everybody, including, of course, women. That in our case, you know, we have succeeded when women find job, women get, you know, a, um, a better education, uh, you know, uh, when women have conditions, um, they can reach a better, uh, better independent uh, life rather than to depend on a man, you know, and that's why many of the problems, especially in low-income people in my country, uh, what we, uh, that's, that's what we have seen. So, uh, the economy is very important in order to make more equal or more opportunities for uh, women, and that's the idea we have in mind. Also, uh, some other laws have to be in place in order to get more care about uh, the, these problems that we are facing, I think, in all South America. But in Bolivia, we are trying to, to solve this problem. And uh, I think uh, if, if, you know, we have not succeeded yet, I think we are doing in the same uh, correct direction all the measures we are taking for solve this problem. Next question. Ah, hello, good afternoon, Hi, Mr. President. Uh, my father is from Bolivia myself, and uh, I got a very interesting, very, very important point to make. If negotiations with Germany continue regarding, will negotiations with Germany continue regarding the joint venture? If not, is that, the, is that the case? Will there be more beneficial privatization of businesses and attraction of foreign firms into the country? If so, Will there be any conditions of hosting from firms to produce inside the country or other conditions? Other political question I have. Will former interim president and your predecessor, Janina Ness, be released from jail and be cleared of the fake charges? And will Morales be held accountable for his fake elections and these things? Many things and people are asking themselves these questions in, in Bolivia. And my good friends in Santa Cruz and my father also, Valdo, and many of his friends had to leave politics because of Morales and many of these things. So you're promising a lot of things, but Morales turned otherwise, and uh, nothing turned out of that how it, how it was supposed to be. I hope that you as president will maybe change some things. I can only place hope in it. And all the Bolivians who suffer, yeah, I hope you can answer some of my questions. And I thank you, President. Muchas gracias. Well, the first part of your questions, um, we are still running a process where there are uh, seven uh, foreign uh, uh, enterprises in order to get the lithium and uh, the business, as I uh, have said before. In the second question, uh, look, there was a coup d'etat, 38 people dead, and uh, no one at this time uh, is responsible for that. It's not in the government hands, it's in the justice hands, because it's a, a judiciary problem. It's not for the government, who is uh, in charge of making better economy, health, uh, you know, uh, education, whatever. Uh, this problem for us has been resolved when an international institution in human rights came to Bolivia made a statement where they say that they were, you know, they kill people from behind, from the back, and uh, somebody has to pay for that. 
uh, no one is, uh, is, has been dead because of themselves, as they used to say at the time, you know. What happened there is that somebody gave the instruction to the military, to the army, that can shut. And somebody has to be responsible for that. Uh, that's the only thing. Of course, we, we have said many times that it was a judicial problem. It's not a uh, economic or whatever problem. It is another issue. So I've been told right there that, science, that there, there's no more time for Zoom questions. Uh, we have uh, a few minutes remaining. Do you want to, was there anything we haven't covered that you want to talk about? Or do you want me, uh, well, first of all. Oh, I think you can, you can uh, make a brief uh, of, what, of, of all what we have uh, said so far, uh, Professor. Oh, okay. Well, uh, you know, we've covered a, a, a wide range of, of, of topics. The, um, uh, a lot of them, uh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm bl to blame that we kept talking about economics uh, more than politics. Maybe I should ask one more political question that has not been asked. It often comes up which is, uh, what are the prospects of Bolivia getting uh, uh, access to the sea? Well, uh, there is already a, um, an, a statement that the International Court made, and we hope that Chile can set up a dialogue process with us in order to solve the problem. Because that's been a, a long-standing problem. Landlocked countries are a big disadvantage. Yeah. yeah. So we, we've talked a lot about uh, uh, the economics, uh, but it's related to the, the politics. And uh, as uh, the president pointed out, um, the, the country began uh, earlier, you know, before you, Morales, with a huge economic uh, divide. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I, many people may not realize it, it was the first really indigenous government in 500 years mm -hmm. uh, in Latin America. And uh, one of the striking things about it is that the progress that was made in uh, reducing inequality and poverty. And uh, as the president pointed out, uh, through a lot, a large fraction of the world, there's what is called uh, a natural resource curse. That countries with more natural resources, mm -hmm. rather than doing better, actually do worse. And what's happened in the last 15 years has been to show that you can actually use your natural resources if you can appropriate them for the people of the mm -hmm. country rather than the benefits going outside, uh, you can actually begin to make some growth, and that growth can be uh, shared. And so there was this earlier question of, you know, what kind of example for other countries? Uh, there are other countries, you know, the richest country in Latin America, uh, two thirds of the country were in poverty. And now they're having, that's Venezuela, now they're having enormous political problems because of the failure, I think, to earlier share the wealth more widely. And I think it's been very wise that, that uh, your, your country has uh, taken the path of trying to make sure the resources are widely shared. But the other thing that's really important um, that we're all, uh, and that your government uh, uh, emphasized is that we have to live within our planetary Boundaries. That's the way I put it. You you put it in terms of Mother Earth. Uh, when I've been down in Bolivia, they talk about it uh, very much, and I think that's something that all the countries of the world have to learn. And we have to live within our planetary boundaries. And unfortunately, it's been a real struggle globally to to learn how to change our economic model to. Uh, to live within our uh, planetary uh, boundaries. Um, 
one of the things I wanted to just pick up also that links uh, the issue that you talked about, import substitution strategy, to the equality issue is that some of the older import substitution models, like in Brazil, were always about big steel mills, big capital intensive. And a lot of what you're talking about has been about things that can be done on a smaller scale and that will benefit ordinary people. So it's an import substitution that is part of the entrepreneurial models. There was a question about entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It actually is an import substitution model that will feed into helping create uh, a more entrepreneurial uh, economy and a, a more dynamic uh, economy. So um, with those just a few remarks, let me uh, thank you so much for coming oh, here. Thank you. And uh, I hope our students and our uh, faculty and uh, the whole range of people on Zoom uh, have found it as uh, insightful and, and uh, uh, learned so much as I have. So thank you very much for oh, coming thank here. Thank you, Professor Stiglitz, and thank you to everybody.